RFID. RFID stands for Radio Frequency Identification. An RFID tag is an object uh, that can be applied to or incorporated into a product, an animal, or even a person more recently for the purpose of, of IDing them using uh, radio waves. Uh, some tags can be read from several meters away and uh, are beyond the line of uh, sight for the reader. Uh, this is just a diagram of a label and an RFID uh, being overlaid together, which is very common. So you get the printed information, the barcode, and the uh, uh, barcode and the unique ID are stored with the RFID technology. Um, so here's an RFID tag that I have here. Um, these are some of the most common. Just a bit of history. Um, we have uh, uh, a little bit before RFID uh, technology was uh, patented during World War II, uh, Germans, Japanese, and British military, they were using radar to spot approaching planes, but they couldn't tell which were enemies and which were allies. The Germans learned that by rolling their planes, they could generate a different signal. And the British had this top secret project uh, where they placed a transmitter in each plane that would receive signals from the stations on the ground and then transmit a signal back to um, identify it as an ally though. Um, so it's pretty sneaky. Then there were uh, two technologies patented in 1973 by two different people. Uh, the active tag that broadcasts a signal was patented and then a passive tag that reflected a signal sent to it. So those together uh, laid the groundwork for RFID technology. Uh, there's kind of an umbrella term is what our RFID is uh, or RFID tag. There's two main kinds. There's passive, which is the most common, and uh, it's powered by energy from the RFID reader, uh, the signal that's being sent uh, to it. So there's no battery. The electric current induced in the antenna of the uh, tag by the incoming frequency produces just enough power in the tag to power up and transmit a response. So it's just passively sitting there until the tag reader sends a signal to it and then it wakes up and uh, that's all it needs. So there's just a microchip, an antenna, but no battery is the main point there. And then there's active, which is less common. It has its own internal power source, which uses the power of a microchip or integrated circuit uh, and broadcasts the signal to the reader. Because of this, the tag can be read from a greater range from the RFID reader, over 300 feet, in fact. So the tag doesn't need to be within the line of sight of the reader, so it may be embedded uh, into an object uh, to be tracked, for example. Um, there are three main differences between RFID tags and barcodes. Uh, they don't need a line of sight, so you don't have to line it up like you would a barcode. You can scan as many items at the same time, as opposed to one at a time with the barcode. And the RFID tag has a memory uh, which can be updated and queried. So things that happen to the object that's tagged will also be stored. So like a timestamp uh, is an example. So if you had like a, uh, if you're tracking uh, uh, medications and you wanted to know if they'd been refilled, that's a good example of something that you'd want stored. Uh, so then there's, three main components to the design of an RFID tag. There's the antenna, which is the outside here, being bent all the way around in a, a frame-like pattern. And this receives and transmits the signal. It's made of aluminum uh, these days. It used to be made out of copper, uh, but aluminum is more common uh, now. And the shape of an, the antenna dictates uh, what kind of uh, application it'll be. It's dependent on the application. So there's different shapes for different applications, which we'll get into. And then there's an integrated chip uh, here. Uh, that's the brains of the operation, the memory, uh, the intelligence, and special features are put on there by the chip manufacturer, again, de de depending on what the application is supposed to do. There's the antenna uh, carrier that's adhered to it using uh, polythylene terephthalate. Uh, they say PET because uh, it's easier to pronounce. Uh, that's the most common, but this can also be paper, which is becoming even more popular, and fabric um, for things like apparel. These are different, um, down below here, uh, different antenna shapes that uh, work for different applications. So you have ones that are for beauty, apparel, and so forth. And uh, 
This aviation one is used for tracking uh, luggage. You have supply chain for uh, going through a warehouse all the way to the store uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, I should mention, no two of those are alike. So uh, every application is gonna have its own uh, antenna and you can interchange these. So something that uh, the apparel uh, antenna could do, um, you could switch it with uh, a beauty uh, product if it did the right job. So you can interchange them. They don't, uh, they're not that, uh, they don't have to be that specific. Uh, some technical notes, uh, UHF RFID, which is the most common, that's ultra high frequency RFID. Uh, the tags communicate at a distance of several meters by changing the way they reflect the reader signals. This is referred to as backscatters, uh, backscatter. Um, it operates at 868 to 950, uh, 915 megahertz. And uh, then there's the uh, high frequency RFID, um, and that operates at 13.56 megahertz. Uh, it has a shorter range, so it's used for things like e-payments, passports, library books, uh, credit cards, things like that. Uh, then there's low frequency RFID, which is uh, predates uh, high frequency RFID. It's used for animal tracking. So if you have a pet, they usually have a tag like this in there. Uh, it's also similar to the Wi-Fi protocol because the tag reader can read multiple tags simultaneously. To avoid collision, they use slotted aloha, so the tags wait for that short random interval uh, before responding with ID, and the reader narrows down individual tags and interrogates until identifying a correct tag. So here's a diagram of the binary tree method in order to do that, um, identifying the tag. Uh, in a broader sense, the, no matter the inner workings of an RFID tag, there are so many different kinds, uh, thousands, seemingly millions, but they're all going to have the same five tasks that they're responsible for. There's optical information, unique ID, attachment, interaction, and removal or reuse. Uh, so with optical information, that's what can be read by a human or an RFID tag reader. So the questions you need to ask when designing these are how large is the label going to be? That's going to dictate the size of your antenna. Um, you also uh, want to know how much um, packaging uh, space is available, um, how much readable information is needed. Um, that'll uh, dictate the kind of antenna that you use as well, uh, because the more, uh, the bigger the antenna, the tag, the easier it is to read. The smaller it is, the harder it is to read, and uh, uh, it need, you need to be close. The reader needs to be closer to the tag. Uh, and is it going to be embedded uh, into the product, or will it be on the outside or dangling? Uh, these are things that you need to uh, be uh, aware of. And then there's ID creation. Um, does it need additional memory or additional functionality. This will influence what kind of chip will be uh, used in the RFID tag. Uh, so there's, a, again, a wide variety available, but 96 bits usually does the job. A 96-bit EPC is what it's called, electronic product code used for most uh, applications. Uh, the 96 bits is broken up uh, thusly. The first eight bits are the header, which identify the protocol. The next 28 identify the organization that manages the data for the tag. And this is assigned by the EPC Global Initiative, which is a standards development body. It works in conjunction with GS1, which develops those standards as well, uh, so that you can uh, make one in the United States and that tag will work in Japan or someplace. Um, the next 24 bits are an object class, uh, identifying the kind of product it is. And the last 36 bits are a unique uh, serial number for a particular tag. Uh, the last two are set by the organization that issued the tag. So similar to a website URL, the uh, total EPC number, the whole thing can be used to key it into a global database and identify that product. Uh, product contents affect the RFID antenna. So if you had like a bottle of pop, for example, 
liquid is something that really interferes with the signal strength and makes it hard for the RFID tag reader to read it. Um, plastic, on the other hand, really amplifies the signal. So they use that a lot for, um, if you've uh, ever worked at a place where you had to have a lanyard and an ID, uh, there it's usually wrapped in plastic and that's why. Um, and how the tag is attached affects how the um, RFID antenna is made as well. Here, for example, is an ID tag uh, sewn into a garment. Uh, this is a pair of French jeans, actually. And you can see that it's got uh, transparency on the front and back, and the EPC symbol is right there. Uh, interaction. Uh, this is probably the most important. You have to consider every time the RFID tag is gonna be read from when it starts at the warehouse to when it gets to the customer. Um, and what does the supply chain look like? Uh, some, uh, you need to have one tag uh, usable by everyone in the whole process. Uh, so during every step, you'd wanna think about um, all of these things. The flooring of the environment is gonna affect the uh, tag reader and, and the frequencies. Uh, the distance between the tag and the tag reader, the number of readers uh, and how each are deployed, the number of nearby tags, number of objects moved simultaneously, uh, the tag orientation. Uh, so is it hanging or is it going to be uh, adhered to the product or embedded? Uh, the amount and direction of the tag rotation, the type of tag, there's so many types of tags, and the type of reader, there are handheld readers, there are ones that are stationary at like uh, uh, shipping docks and things that uh, stay there and track uh, uh, trucks and things like that. So RFID signal strength can be affected by all of these or any of these variables. And then finally, how is it going to be removed? We need a tag that can stay firmly attached but not damage the product. And uh, can it be reused? Oftentimes in a supply chain, for example, they just use a license plate that can be reused over and over. So that brings us to the many, many applications. The most common are uh, anti-theft systems that are used, uh, like the ones I showed here, and uh, implantable RFID chips designed for animal taking. But as you can see from the picture, it's being used for humans more and more regularly. Uh, passports, airline luggage tracking, that's that airline um, antenna that I showed a few slides ago. Inventory systems, uh, retail really uses this a lot. Product tracking for the supply chain, like we talked about. The Coca-Cola uh, drink machine, so um, when you press that you want orange pop, it knows which one you selected, that's RFID technology. So hospitals, museums, libraries, schools, universities, and so many more industries uh, use these. Um, one of the big concerns is security and uh, privacy because of the illicit tracking of RFID tags. Um, so tags that are world readable, uh, like the ones that might be in a passport, pose a risk for um, personal use, but also corporations and military uh, security for people whose job maybe it is to not be uh, so easily found. Um, privacy organizations have expressed concerns with this and uh, they want to uh, stop uh, the embedding of EPC RFID tags in products. Um, so the RFID tagged items are being tracked uh, like a card or a wallet uh, or a phone or car keys, but the person carrying them is as well. And that's sort of the crux of the problem. Um, in the future, as with uh, most technology, RFID is becoming smaller, more powerful, specific, more in ubiquitous. Um, a group of scientists, for example, created tags that were small enough to be attached to an ant to see how small they could make an individual tag and how it would deal with density, the amount of tags nearby it. So all these ants had um, their own individual tags and they wanted to see if that would interfere with the tag reader and they were successful uh, so things like implementation, uh, implantation in humans has become more and more frequent. And I think this will continue um, in hospitals, especially um, for uh, patient tracking and maybe even virus tracking in the very near future, um, given the current state of things. So the next time 
you uh, go to the grocery store or the gas station, or if you're buying holiday gifts, um, you can take a look at uh, products and look around and you'll see things like this, or uh, you'll just, you'll start to notice RFID technology everywhere because it is everywhere, which is exciting and personally kind of terrifying for me. Here are my resources. Thanks for listening.